Um, when I first, um, Richard, when I first approached you about it, you were very clear that you were extremely keen to direct Henry IV, Part One and Two. Was there a particular reason that you felt it would transfer well to film? Because at the end of the day, that's really what we were talking about. Um, I'm not sure I'd thought that far, but I thought that it's my second, they're my second favorite Shakespeare plays. Um, my first being King Lear, and I had done a film of King Lear. I'd filmed a, a theater production I did at the National Theatre with Ian Holm. And um, it was irresistible, but I had, as I remember, one condition. And my one condition was that Simon played Falstaff. <laughs> and um, you, that was one you were able to grant him <laughs> effortlessly. Um, and in addition to that, I mean, one of the things that um, has been asked a few times of this, uh, this series of four Shakespeare histories has been the way in which it's been transferred from stage to screen it has been something more than simply training the cameras on a play or on a, it has been made in a filmic way by which I mean screenplays have been written and in this case uh, Richard you wrote the screenplay for this and it is very much a screenplay I think when I read it I felt it was a filmic adaptation as opposed to simply here's the scene and this is where it ends as it did on stage can you talk a little bit about adapting it now that process helped or hindered you in any way? Well, I started off with a, a mild reverence um, because I thought, you know, you can't... I, I suppose I was a little vague or um, uh, uh, willfully vague about the, the brief. And I said to you, do I have to do the whole play? And you said, no, no, of course. They have to be two-hour films. Um, because I'd done the King Lear, I could do a word count, and King Lear, the film of King Lear lasts two hours, 20 minutes, and then I sort of calculated how many words <laughs> I'd have to cut from both parts of Henry IV in order to get it down to two hours, and I started off being a bit uh, arithmetical about it, and then I started, I mean, I have, I've written two film scripts, which, like all films, end up being financed by Americans. Uh, <laughs> and the first of them was Iris, and I used to get studio notes. And if you've had, as you know only too well, ha experienced studio notes on a script, you, you know you're very, very conscious of things like, I mean, when I started to play with the script, things like, hasn't this scene gone on too long? Where is, I mean, for instance, in part two, the question, if you look at the play, the question arises, what's happened to the king? Because actually you don't see the king for over an hour of the play. And so I took from uh, the, the, a scene in Act Four, I made this scene up. I, I mean, I didn't write a word of it, but uh, the scene where he's playing dice with uh, the boys are playing dice and he comes in. Because simply I thought, well, you haven't seen the king, and you have to know the, the king, otherwise that tension between the king and the son. And, uh, and it's also a matter of how you, if you're adapting it. I mean, we, we've talked about this before, but if you're directing a film, it really, really helps to type out the script <laughs> that you're directing. And even if you're not writing it, but it helps because you think, how do you physicalize it? How do, what location do you, how do you keep the thing moving? And I'm always conscious, when I made my, the first film I made, which was a film that, written by Ian McEwan, for, for, I used to make films for the BBC for years, was a film called The Imitation Game, written by Ian McEwan. And I rang my friend Stephen Frears, who had been making films for some time, and I said, give me some advice. And he had two pieces of advice. One was always think, of the scene you're coming from and always think of the scene you're going to uh, and the same of shot. And the other, the other piece of advice was, if you can't move the actor, move the camera. <laughs> um, so when you're writing a script, uh, when you're adapting a script, you're very much thinking, how do you keep this moving emotionally? Uh, how do you keep it moving physically? Uh, how do you, how, how does this, what's the dynamic of, the thing, and that happens at the script stage. And, and even if the director isn't writing it, it happens at the 
script stage. W were there times when you, when you wished f for a stage? Or w when you thought, I, if only I were doing this on, on stage, never. it would be so much easier? Never, 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 never. There was only one scene which we shot, as it were, like a performance, which has become, for the two of us, a, a sort of legendary occasion, which was in the play scene where Falstaff plays the king and Hal, um, and they switch parts. We sort of rehearsed it. We blocked it out. And all the principals knew exactly what they were doing. But we hadn't actually run the scene, had we? Uh, but we had these wonderful uh, um, extras, supporting well, artists. So, Simon, you talked about that to me, actually, and mentioned it as a great high spot of the whole process. Describe it to... Well, I mean, I, I, we, it was extraordinary because, um, uh, as Richard said, we sort of vaguely put ourselves in the right positions. But because, Richard said, you all know your lines, so and uh, so let's just do it. And that, well, I'll do the master shot, and we'll just film the rehearsal, as it were. And it was one of those sort of sensational moments when the concentration was so intense that, in fact, actually nobody dropped a line, did they? It was extraordinary. So Julie was coming in, and Maxine was coming in, and they're the difficult bits. You know, we have to sort of snap in with a line in somebody else's very big speech. But as Richard says, the supporting artists didn't, you know, knew they were in a pub, but their reactions were entirely dependent on what we did, and they were so acutely focused into the scene that they did exactly what they were required to do. Um, they laughed at the right bits, and of course the scene sends, ends rather sadly, or rather oddly, and they went completely silent without anybody having to say that's what they should be doing. It was an extraordinary moment, actually. and It was a story confidence build, too. And I suppose that, as Richard implies, that was sort of a theatrical way of doing things, I suppose. And that, and that begs the obvious question, which is, what are rehearsals for, then? Why do we spend so much time <laughs> <laughs> angsting over these In details the and coordinating? I mean, and what can you capture on film that you can't on stage and vice versa? Well, the difference for me is that you can, you can localize absolutely precisely. I mean, you do that in the rehearsal room in the theater. Of course you do. But you've always got a sense in the theater you've got to do the whole thing at some point in one go. There's just that absolute concentration on that particular scene for that particular day or two days or three days or whatever it is. And that becomes the sole concentration of your mind. Um, and I think that's the difference for me. And that's actually very, I found this extremely pleasurable. As an experience. <laughs> Can I extremely say something about pleasurable. rehearsal preparation? In my view, filmmaking is 90% preparation, 10% in inspiration. Everybody knows that the job of the actor is to appear, pretend to be spontaneous when the camera is turning over. That's the job. Now, in order to, to allow that to be possible, you have to prepare. Because we had you know five minutes to shoot the whole, I mean, nine weeks to shoot these two films. We had to prepare. We had to prepare. The actors had to prepare. They, we prepared, we sat round the table, we did a bit of standing up rehearsal, but it accumulated over several weeks. The, the, camp, the brilliant Ben Smithard there and Donald Woods, the designer there, had to prepare to a, a degree that people simply don't understand about film. They think filming, it's all, you know, you go, you point a, a camera and yeah, you get the inspiration and the spontaneity. And, it's complete bollocks, <laughs> you know. And and so the 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 job is you prepare to the nth degree in order that you're then confident enough to do exactly what Simon was talking to be spontaneous when the camera is turning up because you know that you know you're not going to make a fool of yourself and that everybody on the crew knows that what the the job is and what they're aiming towards, which is only this extraordinary moment happening in front of, uh, of the lens. So, I mean, if you, as I think you're absolutely right, obviously the 90% of filmmaking is preparation, but uh, therefore, for the actor, when does that 90% uh, 
happen? Whereas normally it would happen in rehearsal, Simon. Did you come to this with, with, with predetermined, with, had you made decisions about false staff away from the process that normally would be dialogue and rehearsal? Because you clearly turned up pretty Prepared. much, well, you'd thought about it and made some big decisions about him, hadn't you? Yeah. Well, false staff's a weird one because uh, compared to other Shakespearean characters I've done, firstly, and this is very shallow of me, but I had the most marvelous makeup. <laughs> <laughs> And a great fat suit, which I probably don't need now, but I had a great fat suit. And I did look at myself in the mirror and think, well, that's about 90% of the work there. I mean, that's, that does so much. And it was, I have to say, Rupert and John Henry, who did the makeup, deserve all my thanks. And, oh, they're there. Okay, I didn't even know they were there. <laughs> Authors of the beard. Authors okay. of the famous beard, which became the dominating feature of the, of the set when I was there. <laughs> Um, keeping the beard straight. So there, there's that, which actually you, you can do with a, a more precision, actually, than you can do in the theatre. I mean, it, 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 that applies to theatre, you know, looking at yourself and going, I see that. The other thing about false stuff, weirdly, is that um, I was thinking, actually, before I come to talk to you tonight, I was thinking about his, his, his internal life is oddly elusive. Um, he, uh, unlike, he does soliloquise, as you see, uh, but he tends to soliloquize about other things. He tends to soliloquize about honor or drink or valor or discretion or... Uh, but he very rarely, like Hamlet or like other great soliloquizers, Iago, he very rarely talks about his own personal feelings. I mean, his feelings for Hal are a great mystery to me. I mean, I don't... I mean, I know what I think he thinks about Hal or Poins or Doll or <coughs> Mistress Quickly. We don't ever hear about what he really feels but I think that's, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think that's one of the great achievements of the film, if I may, between the two of you, is that you have, through film, made very clear his internal landscape. And I think that, I would just say to you, do you think that that, those, is that close-up that you have, uh, that, that Richard holds and holds around the fire with Shallow uh, is so articulate and something that cannot be achieved, that is the absolute... Exactly definition of what can be achieved on Shakespeare on film uh, by artists who know what they're doing uh, that cannot be, I, I suggest, achieved on stage. Actually, picking up what I, what I was saying right. is that, that that was a great joy because you thought, well, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? But you just have to think it. And, and I did come to the, to the set. Um, I was scared, so I had, I had done quite a lot of work on it. Um, uh, and it's quite elaborate language, as you hear, so it's it, it, that even just technically it had to be done. But I did come with a fairly, fairly acute... I mean, I've known men like that, you know. And uh, the theatre used to be full of men like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's le less so now, but, um, you know, I've acted with a lot of them. And I, I, I know, you know, this great... The unexamined life, that's false stuff. It's the man of the unexamined life who's just had a gas and a laugh and is suddenly, in the, the part two of these films, you know, is suddenly approaching the moment when he has to examine. And, and that's why I'm saying he's not a soliloquizer in the normal sense. He's a, he's a pontificator and, he's, and whatever. But the, and, that, and that I had a very clear idea about when I came. And I've also seen that in my life. I've seen men come to the end of their lives and... Um, I'll probably be there myself, you know, unexamined. <laughs>